morning. Yeehaw. We have been in this series, Move, the great adventure, moving with God for the last couple of weeks, learning how we can be a more active and regular participants in that movement. And in this series, we have been studying the book of Acts and how we learned how Acts is basically a two-part volume. Part one is the Gospel of Luke, followed by the book of Acts. Luke is the story of Jesus' movement, and Acts is where the church, the apostles, the disciples, began to pick up on that and do it themselves through the power of the Holy Spirit. The good news is we've been reading through the book of Acts that the work of God began in the early church, but it did not end in the early church. Thanks be to God. We are here today because of the movement and the way it has flourished and grown and persevered throughout 2,000 years. And the same Holy Spirit that resided in those disciples, the same power of that movement resides within us as followers of Jesus today. But as with any movement, any adventure, it has to start with somebody going first. Right? Uh, when my daughter's softball games end, at the end of the game or end of a tournament, they all line up on the lines to go shake hands at home plate. And one of the funniest things that happens, it happens every time it happens, is both teams get lined up on their baselines, and they're ready, and nobody will go. I, I'm all, I find myself every, every game hollering from the back of the line, somebody go. Right? I don't care who goes, some, just start, otherwise we're going to stand here for 10 minutes and look at each other. Right? When I was young, when I was in second and third grade, at the school I went to, one of my favorite classes was computer lab. Now, this is not today's computer lab. This is on the old DOS machines, the old IBM with the, the big five-inch floppy disks, five-and-a-half-inch floppy disks. And I don't even remember anything I learned in that class. But you know why I loved that class? Because at the end of the day, when we were allowed, we had free time, we'd finished all of our work, we were allowed to play this game, the Oregon Trail. Now, for some of you, you may not know that, but some of us, that was the very first video game we ever learned how to play, right? Old brick computers, you couldn't have, the graphics weren't great, right? You, you, would name, you had to give your family names, right? You had to name them. I remember I always named one of the boys William. I don't know why, but I always named one of them William. And you would gather supplies, and you would take your wagon train out west through some keyboard commands, and crazy things would happen, right? That you'd get dysentery. You'd have a fire that would result in exactly 230 bullets being lost. Never understood that. Severe blizzards, you'd lose a day. You'd break wagon axles. You'd have to pay to repair it. People in the game would die. Your family members would die on this journey. But at the end of the day, if you made it, you would get to Oregon and get to the West Coast and complete this journey that was a sort of a simulation of what the original pioneers went through. And whenever, whatever I learned from that game, besides how much fun it was, was how hard it had to have been to have been one of those original pioneers. For us, it was a running joke whether dysentery would show up in that particular save or not. But for those original folks who went west, it was a very real danger, very real things that somebody had to just go. Somebody had to lead the wagon train. And with any kind of pioneer in history, the same is true. There were three in particular that came to my mind this week. One I've talked about before, here, and it's Ernest Shackleton, who in 1914, you may have not have heard of him, but he captained a ship called the Endurance, and their goal was to go to Antarctica and explore Antarctica, and they had this brave crew on this, uh, called the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition, and their goal was to cross and circumnavigate Antarctica before anybody else, but their ship got crushed by an ice flow, and for two years, they fought bravely to survive, and eventually they were rescued and they came back. But what they learned began a pattern of exploration to help us understand that continent we always forget about. About 20 years later, in 1932, there's a woman by the name of Amelia Earhart, the very first female to cross solo across the Atlantic on an airplane. And she decided she was going to try to the next thing, which was what? To conquer, to fly around the world by herself. She was willing to go where nobody had gone, to do what nobody had done, to be the first to do it. And tragically, her life was lost when her plane disappeared over the Pacific Ocean and has still never been found. I think also of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who put so much on the line. We all know his I Have a Dream speech, but everything he fought for, his bravery, his tenacity, his faith, 
that helped pave the way for the civil rights movement in the 60s in this country. And tragically, he was gunned down in 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. But his legacy lives on through all the movements of civil rights throughout the decades since. Every one of those individuals is a pioneer. They did things nobody else had ever done before. They were willing to take on difficult tasks, unafraid of personal consequence, for the greater good of their movement. There was risk involved, but they had faith. Faith in God, faith in a movement, faith in what they believed in. And the book of Acts is a story of individuals who were willing to trust the power of the Holy Spirit, who were willing to step out and say, no one else is going to go, I'm going to go. Forget the consequences. And there's one person this morning we're going to focus on in particular, in the same vein as Shackleton and Earhart and Martin Luther King, who was willing to lay it all on the line for the sake of Jesus Christ. You find the story, we begin in Acts chapter 6. If you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, open those up at the very beginning of Acts chapter 6. Here is what it says. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, some names I can't pronounce, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The story in Acts 6, a little background. As we've talked about the last couple of weeks, the church is beginning to grow in Acts. It's beginning to explode. right? And as it's growing, God is on the move. And as we read these chapters before this, we see the momentum building. There were thousands of people who were joining this movement of God. People were flooding in. And because of this, there were a lot of demands being placed upon the 12 disciples the leaders of this movement. And this is a classic case of a growing church. Right? The demands being placed on those in charge, not just to preach and teach and lead, but also to do all the other things that happen. As the church grows, people begin to feel, well, they've forgotten about me. They've forgotten about what I want. And that conflict, is, we see this for generations in the church, but this is the first time we see it. There's this conflict, and what's happening is the Hellenistic Jews who are the Jews who came by way of the Greek world, who've been educated classically, who've been influenced by the Greek world, were clashing with the Hebraic Jews, those who felt tight to the world in Jerusalem, to the temple life. And they were basically saying, the Hellenistic Jews were saying, hey, one of the things in the Torah, one of the things in the commands is to take care of the widows. And you're taking care of yours, but you're not taking care of ours. You're neglecting ours. It's causing division. Folks couldn't feed themselves. They couldn't take care of themselves as widows. They were being neglected by part of the church. So in response, the disciples called every, all the leaders together and said, listen, we are the leaders of this movement. It's not right for us to give up the preaching, teaching, and study of the word. That's where our focus needs to be. We can't be doing all We don't have enough bandwidth to do all this. So we want you to raise up seven people who are filled with the Spirit, who are wise, and we're going to empower them to do that ministry. You ever heard of Stephen's ministry in churches? Right? That's where it gets its name. The power of the laity to do things that the leadership don't have the bandwidth to do. One of the things we learn from this is that the movement of God is not always static. In fact, it is always stretching. It's always expanding. It's always moving in different ways. It's not confined just to certain things. It's always going to push us to a place we've never been, push the boundaries, push the comfort zones, to get, ask us to give more than we are willing to give to stretch ourselves and our faith. This church where you are sitting or you are worshiping online has existed in some form or fashion since 1897, at least. That's the earliest records we have, 1897. How much culture has changed since 1897? Quite a bit. How much has changed since 1997? Like, culture changes. The world around this church has changed. 
The people in this church has changed. The world has changed. The church has had to be willing to stretch and to try new things, to do new things that have never been done before for the sake of the gospel. The message doesn't change, but the method has changed many, many times over. The message is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, a chance for transformation and for new life, for resurrection. But the method looks different because a movement of God is not static. It is always stretching. It's why we call those, uh, the phrase, we've never done it that way or we've always done it this way, the seven deadly words in the church. Because that's a static mentality. But the movement of God is not static. It is always stretching. It might be uncomfortable, but it should be. If we're to be stre- how many of y'all have ever, when was the last time y'all stretched? How many of y'all is it comfortable to stretch? Right? It's not comfortable. It's meant to move you beyond where you are. Maybe that means for you, maybe you haven't exercised your ministry muscles in years. Maybe even decades. Maybe never. You used to do something, but you got tired. You got distracted. Other things got in the way on your calendar. Maybe it's time to consider how you can step out in new ways now. Maybe it's time. Maybe we've never done anything. Maybe you've never served in the church a minute in your life. You've been a part of a church here or anywhere else for decades, but you've never served. Maybe it's time to stretch a little bit, to serve our young people, to serve our shut-ins, to serve at a homeless shelter where folks desperately need not only material things, but they need love and compassion and grace. Maybe it's volunteering at food pantries. Maybe it's stepping out into the world and serving somewhere beyond our local community. But we're going to be pushed. We're going to be stretched. That's what makes good pioneers. They're willing to go beyond that. They're willing to go where nobody else has gone, where nobody may have even considered to go before. And the leaders in chapter 6 of Acts say they, they speak, and they say these seven people, they need to go and do these things. They need to go and do these things that need to be done, but they're not for us to do. But we pick them seven carefully. They are full of wisdom. They are full of the Spirit. They're not just seven random names drawn out of a hat. The Bible suggests here there are qualifications to be a pioneer. But that qualification is not perfection. That qualification is not a specialized training. That qualification is a desire to step out in faith. Someone who is positioned to do what God has called them to do. Notice in this passage, they don't say, hey, find seven young people to go and do this thing. They don't say, find seven people who have time in their schedules. They say, find seven people who have the passion of the Spirit in them. Who have the wisdom of the Spirit in them. They'll be the ones that go and serve. There are people in this church And in the community who I've come across in my years here, who have that wisdom, who have that inbreaking of the Spirit present in them. They're willing to do new and faithful things for the sake of the gospel. But my question is not to them, but to the rest of you. Are you willing to be pioneers? Are you willing to step out in faith and try something new or something different? Maybe God is calling you to stretch your proverbial muscles, your ministry muscles in a way you've never even considered, but maybe has been, you, upon reflection, you are uniquely positioned to do. So they chose seven people, Stephen, Philip, the others, Nicholas. And then it says this, and Stephen is the only one we get any information about in this group. But here's what it says about Stephen. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, for members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Notice it says, it doesn't say they can't argue with Stephen. They can't argue with the Spirit that was in Stephen. So Stephen begins his ministry, he begins serving wondrous ways, performing miracles, leading the lay servant tree of the church. But immediately opposition shows up, begins to push back. See, Stephen's purpose was the gospel, to spread the gospel through love and compassion, to tell people that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But these things were not popular in the culture in which Stephen lived. The largely Jewish culture around Jerusalem said, no, that's not who Jesus was. 
We don't believe that. They began to push back on him, but he would push back and say, Jesus is the answer to your questions. Jesus is the answer to those problems in our community. And he began to push it back and push back, and conflict got stirred up, and it got more and more agitation. If you're going to be a pioneer for the faith, I need you to know, I want you to understand, there will be opposition. There will be people, there will be situations that will fly in the face and try to make your life difficult. Faithful pioneers will always face opposition and challenge. Sometimes great, sometimes that niggling opposition that's just enough to make you want to give up. Not dysentery, but the axle keeps breaking. A spoke in the wheel keeps cracking. Till you say, I'm tired of this, I don't want to do it anymore. Because make no mistake, if we're living out the voice of Jesus in the world, opposition will arise. Jesus promised that. Jesus said, there will be opposition. The world will hate you because the world hated me. The enemy wants nothing more than to stop the movement of God in its tracks. But the reason it works in Acts and the reason it works today is the Spirit is always with those who are willing to step out in faith. Willing to step out of the boat like Peter in Matthew 14. To keep their eyes on Jesus that they might walk on water. Willing to go where nobody else has gone to step into a dangerous situation, personally, reputationally, or otherwise. To go with God and do something great. There will be opposition. There will be difficulty. We'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks in another message. But don't let it dissuade you. Don't let it get in your way. If you are living a life that is faithful to God and you're stepping out in faithfulness to God, God will carry you through. God will walk right with you in that movement. And those who oppose Stephen in the Bible, they spoke out against him. They pushed back against him. They spread rumors about him. But he was so filled with the Spirit that verse 15 in chapter 6 is Stephen's hair. His face shone like an angel when he spoke. Imagine that. So filled with the Spirit that everybody could see it, even those who didn't believe. And all these things he did, and and the folks around Stephen, they got so agitated, they demanded explanations. They demanded an accounting for why he was doing what he was doing. And and in chapter 7, Stephen launches into this incredibly impassioned, spirit-filled sermon. Where he basically explains the entire Jewish story to them. The entire story of God's movement from the beginning till then and why Jesus is who Jesus said he is and that Messiah that God promised has been sent and was here walking among you and you you put him on a cross and you killed him but yet he has risen from the dead to save the world and as you can imagine that made the people around Stephen very happy right no it made them more angry more upset with them it, it uses, one, to describe the crowd around him, it just uses one of my favorite biblical words, indignant. They were indignant at what Stephen said. How dare he say these things to us? They didn't want to hear, but they needed to hear it. And here's the response to Stephen after he's been arrested and accused of everything, and he's given his impassioned speech. When the members of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Jerusalem, when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now to be clear here, that's the way we talk in the Bible, talks about people dying. Stephen was killed for his faith, stoned to death, the very first martyr for Jesus in the history of the church. He's the first one to lose his life on behalf of his faith in Jesus. But yet something happens immediately following this. The church that was growing begins to explode, begins to grow in in leaps and bounds by exponential numbers because of what Stephen was willing to do. There's an open floodgate that begins to flow of persecution of the early Christian movement 
Saul being one of the chief leaders of that persecution. The persecution ramps up and the church scatters going out from Jerusalem to all these different places. And all of a sudden they are sharing everything Jesus taught them in places they had never been in before. The church scatters, they're sharing about Jesus who was crucified, risen from the dead. Who was the Messiah who came to rescue us. And because of this the church truly begins to become a global, regional movement. We talked about last week or week before about the early church father, Tertullian, who says that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's only when people are willing to bleed for the church, literally, metaphorically, the church begins to grow. And that's what happens in Acts 6 and 7. Remember the very beginning, a couple weeks ago, Acts 1, verse 8? Jesus gives the command, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But to this point, they haven't left Jerusalem. It's been all in and around the city of Jerusalem. But it takes Stephen, who's willing to bleed for us, who's willing to go without fear where God leads him, for the church to begin to move beyond Jerusalem. With any kind of movement, someone has to take the risk. Someone has to step out in faith. The truth is there are many of us who who will look around at the world around us, and we see things that break our hearts. We see things that we are passionate for and passionate against. They look and and see children being trafficked trafficked around the world and say, we need to do something. Someone needs to stop this. There are those who would look around and see the the brokenness of nuclear families in our community, in our world, and say, someone's got to stop and put uh, put an end to this trend of divorce and of separation and of brokenness in relationships. Some look at addiction in our community and say, we've got to find a way to help those people, to help them find new life. Not just free of addiction, but reunited and living for Jesus. But the question is, so many of us see it, how many of us are willing to step out in faith and do something? I love the the Matthew West West song, Do Something. And this is a a, a snippet of what it says. I woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble. How did we ever get so far down? How is it ever going to turn around? I couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, Children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me. So I shook my fist at heaven and said, God, why don't you do something? How many of us have ever felt that way in life? And the chorus says, he said I did. I created you. If not us, then who? If not me and you, right now it's time for us to do something. Someone's got to be willing to be pioneers, to get out of the pews, to move outside the walls of the church, to go first. Something that happens when we are willing to believe. We're willing to put our faith in Jesus for more than just Sunday morning. That we see something, we say, I know that's going to demand resources. I know that's going to demand my reputation. I know it's going to demand my time, but it doesn't matter because it's bigger than me. It's so important to God. Someone needs to do something, and I am positioned in a way that I can do something. So let's do it. But here's the thing about pioneering. Pioneering can be lonely. It can be a very lonely place. In fact, when Stephen dies, there is no mention of the other disciples. He is by himself in this crowd of people trying to crush him and kill him. The only person who's mentioned with Stephen is Jesus. Jesus Christ. It says when when Stephen looks up, he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now That's a unique phrase because everywhere else in the New Testament... When you see Jesus mentioned after his ascension, he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. But here, Jesus is standing at the right hand of God the Father. Commentators, scholars don't agree on exactly what that means. But as Stephen is stoned and killed, Jesus is standing. Standing next to God, watching. I think maybe he's offering praise He's offering support for Stephen who's going through what nobody else has been willing to do. Now before Stephen ever makes it to this place, we need to understand that Stephen wasn't trying to die for the gospel. Stephen didn't set out to die for Jesus. He was just trying to be faithful. All he was trying to do was do what he had been positioned to do, to feed, to take care of the widows, to take care of those who needed help. He didn't set out to get his name into scripture. He didn't set out to become famous. He set out to take care of the lost, the least, and the lonely. That was his intention. 
He was just waiting tables and serving brothers and sisters in the household of God. He wasn't there to make a name for himself. He was there to make a name for Jesus Christ. But I've noticed that when it comes to being a pioneer, typically I get two responses when I ask folks if they're willing to do something. One is they're absolutely terrified. No way, couldn't be me, not going to happen. I'll write you a check. Would that make you feel better? No, it would not. Right? Or they're super excited about it. And they want to jump into the deep end of the pool with both feet and before they ask any questions. But the truth is, whether you're at the end where you're so excited or whether you're terrified, God has called you to be faithful with exactly where you are right now. See, the problem with both of those approaches, one is you're not willing to do anything. The other one is you're willing to do and try to do more than what God has positioned you for. Because preparation always precedes pioneering. We remember all those little funny signs at the end of Oregon Trail when things happened. We forget you started in Independence, Missouri, buying supplies for the journey, preparing the ground, preparing the path. Maybe it's simple as showing up for vacation Bible school and passing out apples and cheese cut into creative shapes for our kids to enjoy. You think that's not a big deal, but it's a big deal to those kids you're serving. Maybe this morning you held a door for somebody as you came in. You made somebody feel welcome in a household of God. Maybe you offered a smile that you didn't know they desperately needed. You may not think it's a big deal, but it's a big deal. Preparation for whatever God has laid before you that you don't know about yet. You're learning and experiencing things in ways you would never do on your own. Before Moses ever led God's people out of Egypt, what was he doing in the wilderness? He was a shepherd leading sheep. Before David ever fought and killed Goliath, he was fighting lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Right. Before Saul, who we just read about, became Paul, the greatest apostle and teacher and disciple in the history of the church, he was an expert in the faith and in making arguments for his way of life. He was basically a religious lawyer. Without that training, does Paul become the most impressive and the greatest church planner in history? Preparation precedes pioneering, and I want us to understand that sometimes what God's preparing you for is not the big thing. It's the first little steps. It's the first movement towards him. Because a true pioneer's effort will never go to waste. You're always learning something. You're always planting a seed. One of the things I love about youth ministry is the chance to plant seeds with young people. What I hate about youth ministry is you know how often you see the fruit of that planting? Almost never especially if you don't stay in the same church for 20 years, right? But that seed you plant in a young person with some apples and cheese and crackers at VBS might bear fruit 30 years from now when they find a faith of their own, when they make sure their children have the same experience so their children will get to know the love of God. I think Jesus is standing at the right hand of God because of what's happening in Acts and what's about to happen. In the next chapter of Acts is the very reason we are sitting and standing here today. Because Stephen did what he did, you and I are in this place, worshiping Jesus 2,000 years later. So if you ever think that there's little things you can do, they won't make a difference, they will. I promise you they will. God will not waste a moment. God will not waste the effort. Jesus knows where he's going. He's standing because he says, this is what I want. I want people to step out in faith and to do the things I've prepared for them to do that the movement will carry on. So today we're going to close with a time of prayer. And I want to invite you this morning. We've done before, we've done this prayer. But I want us to do this prayer. You don't have to put it all the way up. I mean, you can, you can be the nice little Methodist in the pew and just hold your hand. Yeah, it's okay. All right. But this is saying yes to God. Not just give, but yes, God. <laughs> So we're going to pray together, and I want you to invite to pray. In your, pray silently with me as we pray this morning. Let's pray. God, I, I want to do something. I want to be a pioneer. I want to try something that's never been done. I want to step out in faith to make a difference for whatever that looks like, whatever that means, God. And I pray for all of these folks who have their hands raised this morning. That their physical way of saying yes to you, they would trust you, they would follow you, they would go places they've never dreamed of going. 
pray that whatever you have put on their hearts and in their lives today, whatever difference it is you have for them to make, whether it's in a ministry, whether it's opening the door, that you would give them the faith and the confidence to take that next step, to be a pioneer for your movement. I pray that in the years to come, we would see the fruits of those seeds planted right now that lives would be touched, communities would be transformed, brokenness would be healed in your name. We Put it in your hands, Lord, we trust you. Fill us with your spirit. Empower us with your spirit that we might step out in faith and in confidence for you. We pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.